CES 2022. Let's do it. So we just got back from CES in Las Vegas. It was a really good time. I first got to go to CES in 2018 with Court from Electric Bike Review, and I was inspired to try to make it back. And so when I got an invitation from Bosch to come out, I was surely gonna take it. Despite a lot of the larger vendors pulling out, we decided to still make it out because I felt like it's an important time in the industry and there's a lot of things going on. And for those of you who don't know, CES is the Consumer Electronics Show and it's held usually in the beginning of the year in Las Vegas. I think it's normally about 200,000 people attended. This year is about 70,000. They did have a lot of protocols in place as far as masks are required and I think vaccination is required. They did actually provide us with two tests so we ended up taking them and that was an interesting experience. I think I just broke it. I totally did. I think that's why they give you two of them. So idiots like me, you know? Round two. Open this thing up. Five, six. That was seven, but I think it'll still work. And now we just wait. How far? I didn't read it. Do you have COVID? I do not have COVID according to my lollipop. Now, usually my videos are mostly about bikes and e-bikes, but this one will be a bit of a departure from that as I just wanted to cover overall what went on in the show. There was certainly some e-bike stuff and you know, partly we got invited out because Bosch was really introducing this smart system and, and I think it actually helps things to come together as you put it in context with the rest of what's going on in this space with all the different autonomous vehicles and you know different sensor technology and AI, VR, all that sort of stuff. But overall, I generally see the show as just kind of a glimpse into the future and you get to see you know things that are in development and what we might see. And then if you could try to picture how those things all might come together. And I think that that's what we're starting to see more and more of now, right? Like how these different technologies connect to each other and grow and build off of each other. And I guess that's kind of the idea of this smart system by Bosch, but I try to look at it from just the overall picture of like what's going on in the industry and how this stuff is gonna potentially change our world because things are changing quite a bit actually. So I'll just kind of highlight some of the things that I thought that were interesting, fun, weird, whatever, because there was definitely a little bit of all that. I hope you guys enjoy this, so. So first on the fun part, there was a autonomous race car. I was actually thinking that we might end up seeing this in the future, but I didn't know that it would happen so quickly. When I got to check out the Formula E event in Brooklyn last year, for those of you who don't know, it's actually electric Formula One cars that race around the track and they go uh, all over the world. I do wonder if, in the future, actually, race cars don't have people in them. They're actually just all autonomous. One thing that I thought was kind of interesting, John Deere had a fully autonomous tractor. So basically, you have a farm, you could potentially run this tractor, and I guess you could be sitting in your house and just watching it work. Wouldn't want to get run over by one of those things. Damn. More and more of these sort of things, you know, autonomous vehicles, uh, robots, loads of robots. We saw them pretty much everywhere. I mean, most of the robots seem to be doing relatively basic things, just carrying packages. Well, I guess we did see some like robotic arms and that sort of thing, but not so much like connected, fully functioning robot. I guess this show is more targeted at things that are actually like on the market available for sale now. So maybe we're not totally there. I I don't know. So the first day we spent a lot of time in the mobility and like transportation space and it seemed to be all LiDAR everywhere. For those of you who don't know, LiDAR is basically a technology that you use a laser and it shines onto things and it reflects back and basically builds like 3D images based on that information and they can vary in their levels of complexity and, and detail, I guess you can say, depending on how advanced the sensors are. This Technology is being used in all sorts of different things in the mobility space as we're 
often focused in traffic signaling it's a really big thing so they can actually make determinations of if it's a bike or if it's a car or if it's a train or whatever and change the timing of lights maybe not even be so based on timing maybe just be based on the types of vehicles and people that are in the space and then when it comes to like autonomous vehicles for example they can map out the area around and they can make determinations of where they can go where they can't go when they might want to stop if there's a certain hazard in front of them. It's still kind of coming along, but it does seem like it's the sort of thing that could actually ramp up pretty quickly because you can have one LiDAR sensor could potentially cover a very large area. And if you think about it in relation to say like traffic lights, in a lot of places in North America, they have these induction loops underneath the street and they can sense that a car is going over them. Now you can re replace those with LiDAR. You can do a lot more advanced things with your traffic signal. It does seem like that's the direction you're going. One of the challenges is communicating all this data. So this seems to be a hot topic right now is 5G, um, having this like faster network speeds that they can communicate all this stuff through like Wi-Fi or some version of it. So a lot of times you have this kind of push and pull with technology and, and regulators and this and that, but CES is definitely the place where this stuff just lives and, and people just show it and no shame and just get it out there and those ideas are flowing and it's kind of cool to experience that. Uh, we do have to be cautious about that, I'll talk a bit about that later, but another thing that I thought was really interesting was this special sensor tech that Bosch had. Now. I initially became aware of this as they have this sensor that was used on the space station and it can actually sense if something's wrong with the space station. This one sensor, it has all sorts of different things in it. So one, it has a sensor that's like a very advanced microphone. Another one, it's a barometric pressure sensor. They also have inside, it's an air quality tester. They can actually make determinations on like what is actually inside of the air beyond just like the air quality is bad. There's actually saying like, oh, there's like metal in the air or uh, they did this test to see like there's actually like alcohol in the air. But what I would like to show you is how well you can detect different smells. What you see here, this is the output. So this is the detected smell. Currently we have normal air. Um, you see there are four different yellowish liquids. Yeah? Yeah. And I just put the sensor in one. Let's maybe start here. So now the sensor is in. And you can already see that the gas sensing wow. measurements is changing. Um, so one scan takes 10.8 seconds because the sensor is measuring different sensitivities and then you directly see, hey, this is an alcoholic drink. Like you could think about it, maybe this is something that could be inside of an automobile, for example, as opposed to this like breathalyzer thing that some people get sometimes. But I actually thought about something uh, interesting as it relates to bikes and stuff like that. One, you can uh, measure the sound of somebody using bolt cutters or an angle grinder and they can actually use artificial intelligence, record that sound and then actually make determinations of whether that sound is being repeated and they can set certain alarms based on that. or That's really interesting, but he actually advised me they could even take it a step further. If somebody was using an angle grinder, for example, you could actually sense that there's metal in the air. The angle grinder would be like kind of kicking up dust from the metal. These are the sort of things that I think about and like how can we take these technologies that are being used in this space and, and, and bring them to other places. But currently they're using this for other things. I mean, one of the things they're using it for is like in uh, babies that might have issues they can put in that ward, if you will, and they can actually make determinations if there's any issues with the babies based on their breathing or their heart rate and different things like that. Just listening for that sort of stuff. So, And they also showcase that they use this technology in forests, so they'll actually put that around in forests and they can sense from a very far distance that a fire uh, is being started or something along those lines. And they can actually address it in a much more rapid way. So thinking about all this stuff that's happening on the West Coast where I am now with forest fires and all that sort of thing, I'm sure it'd be really helpful to be able to understand that that's happening way before you know you might otherwise, because I think it's otherwise very challenging to keep track of these things. And not to harp on this sensor thing too much, but I do think that actually a lot of the new technology is really gonna be based on that. Electric motors are only gonna improve so much. Battery tech, yeah, I'm sure it's gonna improve and there might be new technologies and this and that, but the way that we bring this all together from my perspective really is sensors, like trying to understand like what's going on, make determinations and then actually being able to act on that. So it's even thinking, you know, as this stuff might relate more to the bike world, as that's what I generally focus on, 
what if we had one of these sensors on a bike, for example, and it might be able to tell you when you need lube on your chain or that your derailleur is out of adjustment or that you need your brakes replaced. Now, I didn't get this information from Bosch, so you know, if anybody's wondering, but this is the way that I think, and, and it's actually kind of the cool thing with, with a company like that, they have all this technology built in and they could potentially pull these things together and, and make something really cool. Thinking about not just what's happening here on Earth, thinking about space. I mentioned the space shuttle and we saw this thing called uh, Sierra Space. Apparently they have some contract to build housing on space. It's kind of like building on the space station that not just astronauts can go, but also normal everyday people. Checking out space stuff, I don't know. Would you go to space? I don't know if I'd want to go to space. I don't think I'm that ambitious. Whatever. It's an interesting thing. I mean, for me, I'm trying to understand the desire of people to, to have that experience. I mean, I think that we're challenged with people being like so isolated and everything like that to potentially be even more isolated and go to space. Like, do we need to do that? Is that the right move? I, I don't know. If you really want to be isolated, I guess you have all sorts of different things or they have opportunities that you can just like sit in your room and you could connect with the world through like meta or whatever, or you know, you can sit in one of these massage chairs and put a VR goggles on and maybe hook up an IV and, and they have these like haptic vests and suits and so you can basically almost experience the world but not really experience the world. Kind of like that movie Wally where there's like really heavy people just laying in a recliner, floating around, looking at screens all day. I think it can easily go too far. Can we actually still have this true connection? Do people actually understand what level of connection they actually need in their lives? I mean, this is a thing I've been thinking about a lot with how it relates to bikes and that sort of thing. You know, the comparison of like riding a bike in a city or driving a car is a very different experience. Your senses and the way that you connect with people and the opportunities for connection and all that sort of thing are, are, are vastly different. So Adorama, this guy works at Adorama. You know, we were talking about, we, we need a sponsor. I mean, give me a shout, man. I can hook you up. I'm the manager of the digital. Program. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Rich Williams, man. Y'all yeah, have a good day. Y'all take yeah. care. Be Don't safe, man. All right. That is New York on a bicycle. That is New York walking. That's not New York in a car. But I guess that begs the question, I mean, could all forms of connection be replaced in this virtual space? Can we actually achieve that? What about touch? What about a deeper level of touch? You know, something that you might only share with a significant other or something like that. Could you replace that? I mean, there's actually one company that kind of claims you can. I don't know how I feel about it, but uh, it's called the Handy. It's kind of weird. He sees this video and then the Handy moves. <laughs> Another topic that's been coming up quite a bit is sustainability. I mean, I'm in this electric bike space, mobility, thinking about, you know, green technology. Sustainability is a big deal. It's a big deal in our industry. We're fortunate that most of our partners are, are very strong on this topic. Actually, Bosch is actually carbon neutral, one of the few companies out there, probably the largest company. Another one of our partners, Riesen Mueller in Germany, has been really focused on this. We saw this from other companies as well. I mean, like Samsung had this big thing about sustainability and they were showing how their boxes could be reused and you could create like sculptures from them all this sort of stuff and a lot of other companies like just voice what their carbon goals are for the next 10 20 plus years but just thinking about this I mean thinking about the products that we use and I think a lot about our products built to be sustainable are they built to be you know, upgradable on some level? Are they you know, built to be like throwaway products or repairable? You know, many people, including myself, flew to the event. It's definitely not the greenest thing. We did try to use the monorail as much as possible and that was pretty cool. It would be really nice if it went to more places throughout the city. I guess they do have the buses as well. I did have a friend, Brian, that actually rode his bike from Southern California all the way to Las Vegas, which was pretty impressive. He's kind of done some similar things like that before. This is not your first time riding to Vegas though, but this is the first time in this type of weather, I imagine. This is my first time ever riding in this type of weather where yeah. it's below 30 degrees. It was yeah. cold. Speaking about sustainability, battery recycling was a very big topic. You know, people bring this up a lot about batteries and them not being so sustainable, but actually with this new program called Call to Recycle, they're able to actually recycle 
almost the whole battery uh, assembly, which is uh, pretty cool. And they're able to reuse a lot of the materials uh, inside the battery. But really as a society, I think we need to continue to think about like what are the moral and ethical implications of the choices that we make. How are they gonna impact others? And could we potentially make better choices that have better long-term effects and potentially hurt less people? I think that that's probably a good strategy. Because the reality is, from what I learned in the e-bike space, is that a lot of times there's not specific testing or requirements. It's generally a pretty open market and people could kind of do what they want. They were talking about this thing of like a digital trust seal. So basically you see that, you know that it's safe. Similar to something like UL, for example, we actually got to talk with the folks at UL. This is underwriting laboratories, primarily used in the US, but I know it's more of a, it's an international thing. This is a big topic when it comes to batteries. I actually learned that their company actually started years ago in relation to uh, fires that were happening from electrical lighting in buildings. Like they were talking about like early 1900s. So they actually created UL to test these products and to ensure that they were safe. And many buildings would say, well, okay, well, we can use them, but they need to be the tested ones. It's kind of weird that we work this way and that we maybe haven't learned too much about this, but I'm probably gonna do another video just on that and like, battery safety and that sort of thing because definitely a big topic but I think in thinking about all the tech I think it's just thinking about the safety overall like how can we ensure that you know we're making the right decisions that these things are not going to cause harm really right because they all kind of have the potential to some stuff to think about hopefully uh, you guys enjoyed this video definitely enjoyed making it definitely enjoyed going to CES let me know if you want to see more videos like this I know it's a little outside of our norm but uh, hopefully you enjoyed and uh, see you soon